Good afternoon. Let's look at, uh, I see the comments and say James Knox was confused in uh, Day of Christ with Day of Lord. Which they said uh, with many, uh, many dispensations too. Uh, they'll try to say Day of Christ means is proven to be a deity of Christ, and so it's the same thing as the Day of the Lord. And they, get, they trip over the phrase at hand, and they ignore the fact that in Philippians you see the Day of Christ includes the judgment seat of Christ. So at hand means the fact that they thought they were missing the judgment seat of Christ. The rapture had happened and they missed it and, and the judgment seat of Christ was about to occur. You see that in Larkin's charts. So, day of Christ, not day of Lord. Two separate events. So you have to reconcile them. So, uh, Pastor James Mox, he, he goes and he's about 4.30 and he says, first one, Paul is saying he's, he's here, he expects the rapture to happen, and he includes himself with the church, unlike what Kim has said. Kim ignores first one, essentially. Because Paul is saying there, that's a rapture verse there. The gathering would include him. So let's go here. But with a reminder that you continue to gather together in the name of and around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same admonition would be given to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter number 10. Another group of people who felt that it was no longer worth looking for and waiting for the coming of the Lord and had begun to forsake the assembling of themselves together. And so the Apostle Paul here says, you haven't missed it. He's still coming. Keep gathering together. No. It has nothing to do with the gathering as assembly. This has to do with the rapture. It's not telling people to gather together because they're separating, they're not gathering together anymore. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our, our gathering together unto him. Our gathering together, together unto him. He's talking about the rapture. It has nothing to do with the local church getting together. You gotta watch this stuff. <laughs> Get this stuff. I'm writing you on that on that premise and that basis. Secondly, in verse number two, I want to encourage you, I, I beg you, not to to be soon shaken in mind. Not to be soon troubled. And this is the tendency of emotional believers this is the tendency of young believers this is the tendency of believers who are insecure either in their personal life or in their relationship to Jesus Christ they they tend to leap into fear and tiptoe into faith they tend to rush into doubt and hesitate when confronted with certainty. All it took for these saved people living for Jesus was one little rumor that they'd missed the coming of the Lord. And they began to be shaken to the point of dropping out of fellowship. All they had to hear was one false report, one uh, mis uh, misrepresentation of the truth. And they, they began to lose their hope and lose their confidence. And Paul had to write to them and say, don't, don't be so quickly influenced by things that are not so. It appears they're getting a, a phony letter in Paul's, uh, uh, that Paul hadn't written, but people were saying Paul did write. So they were getting some false, a false document regarding this issue. He also had to warn them about, not only about uh, being soon shaken in mind and troubled, but about the source of, of, of false leadership. He says, neither by spirit. There are saved people in every age. There are saved people in every church who are 
overly influenced by spirits, real or imagined. They are overly influenced by their own spirit. They tend to believe that they hear things, that they get revelations, that impressions or thoughts are somehow the ministry of God, a private ministry to them. Those things have caused you to be moved away from fellowship and moved away from your confidence in God and they'll lead you to be shaken up and troubled. You can't stand on something as, as, as shifting, something as, as sandy as a spiritual impression. There's many a time as a young believer that I thought, maybe I'm not saved after all. There's many a time as a young Christian I would do this or that and think, a saved person never could have done that. I, I must not be saved. Well, thank God I, 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 I might have been wrong about my understanding, but I sure am glad that people taught me to, to look to the Bible, not to how I felt at the moment. To look, to, what, to look at what the Word of God said, not how it seemed in my spirit that things were working out. And the Apostle Paul has to write to this good church. These are good Christians at Thessalonica. And he said, stop being influenced by spirits. They're going to trouble you. Then he says, nor by letter as from us. You realize that as far back as 50, 60 A.D., 30 years after the resurrection, the Apostle Paul is still living, traveling, evangelizing, building churches, and there were people out there who were so dishonest and so corrupt, they were writing letters to the churches pretending to be the Apostle Paul. That's the beginning of the apostasy. The apostasy began in the first century. I have some of them. I have, I have my library, so, some supposed epistles of Paul to Pilate, and an epistle of Paul to Laodicea, and this and that, and they're, they're obvious frauds to those of us who have a finished New Testament to compare them to. But if you went to the mailbox one day and it said to the church of Thessalonica from Paul, well, you couldn't take the New Testament, lay that letter down next to it, and make sure it really was from Paul. So here's what he had to say to them. If I wrote you a letter, it wouldn't have left you troubled. If I wrote you a letter, it wouldn't have left you fearful. If I wrote you a letter, it wouldn't have left you doubting. If I wrote to you under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it would have built you up on your most, most holy faith. It would have encouraged and strengthened you. So if somebody writes you a letter that makes you afraid, I didn't send it. Don't pay any attention to it. Well, aren't you glad uh, the early church had leaders like that, that? That they could count on to lead them on. But don't you realize that even in those days, there were bad men trying to influence the churches and turn them away from sound doctrine. It's not a new thing. Okay, now he says this. I don't want you to misunderstand and think that the day of Christ is at hand. Okay? Jesus Christ is the Lord. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is, in His deity, He is the Lord. Okay? From, from before Genesis 1-1, He's the Lord. At Bethlehem, the Lord became Jesus. There's no Jesus in the Old Testament. There's no Jesus in eternity past. Mary gave birth to a baby, and they called his name Jesus. Jesus is the humanity of the Lord. He's the Lord manifest in the flesh. Okay? Now, Christ is a title. In the Old Testament, the word is Messiah. 
Jesus is the Messiah, not of the church. The church has no Messiah. He's not the Messiah of the earth. The nations have no Messiah. He is the anointed, chosen king of Israel who will sit upon the throne of David at Jerusalem and rule and reign for a thousand years. Okay? The day of the Lord is the day when God takes over the earth. The day of Christ is the day when the Jewish Messiah reigns in the Jewish capital on the Jewish throne over the Jews. Okay. That's wrong. <laughs> That's wrong. But a lot of dispensations make that mistake. They see if they have Christ, and they see Christ is referring to the deity of Jesus Christ, the Lord, and uh, they use that and everything. They have Christ. You, you do you look up the verses. Look up Philippians. The day of Christ. Paul, Peter, uh, uh, Paul is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Go to lock it. So I just want to put this real quick. I got a lawn guy's coming. I'm going to make a lot of noise in the background. I'll listen to the rest of this video later. I mean, if there's anything in there he says more about the day of Christ, I'll, I'll look, try to see if I have anything else. He might give possibilities what else the day of Christ could mean. But here he's trying, uh, this is a typical dispensationalist view, a preacher view, that they're saying, well, the day of Christ. They're not looking at Philippians. They're not looking at those verses that deal with the judgment seat of Christ. And they're ignoring the problem. They're ignoring that problem. The fact is that the, uh, the pe people who are against the pre-tribulational rapture being imminent, they look at the day of Christ as referring to the rapture. Or an aspect of the rapture. And they say, well, they're saying it's at hand. But they're saying also the Antichrist is to show up. He also threw in the idea by gathering together as a local, local church. It doesn't have to do with anything. Uh, we see, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Obviously, he's going to gathering him up, up in the, uh, yeah, not to gather together unto him. I'll stop here and put this up. Any comments you want to watch further? I have, again, I'm the uh, long guys coming. I don't need to be with that. This is common among dispensationalists. It's a common mistake. But the day of Christ refers to a particular day, not referring to Christ's deity and every nation, every nation shall bow to Christ and, and or Christ is the Messiah or anything like that. It refers to a particular day uh, the judgment seat of Christ, which is preceded, has to be preceded by the rapture. And so, if this is referring to the day of the Lord, the rapture would have to precede that. He's got, the, the day of the Lord would be preceded by the rapture, the falling away, and then they reveal the man, the, the son of perdition. That's the events that would have to happen. Because the rapture is the next, next prophetic event. So we start to put this up. Amen, thank you.